go. Again, welcome everybody. It is so, I'm so glad that you're here. Good afternoon and welcome to the Research and Impact Committee's Summer Conversation. Since the beginning of our summer conversations, our goal has always been to provide an informative conversation around the issues that relate to conducting research on the impact of open educational resources at your institution and beyond. Today, we're joined by Louise Feldman, who is an associate professor and reference librarian and OER librarian at Delaware County Community College in, in Pennsylvania. Previous, Louise was the business librarian and college liaison librarian coordinator at Colorado State University from 2005 to 2019 and served as the librarian during the semester at sea's fall 2017 voyage. Louise will be discussing an institution-wide OER course inventory and dashboard that was designed and used to capture, document, and display the use of no, uh, no and low-cost course materials at Delaware County Community College. Again, welcome to our summer conversation, and I'm going to turn things over to Louise to discuss this exciting project. Thank you, Michael. Um, welcome, everyone, um, and thank you for attending my session this afternoon. Uh, many thanks to CCC OER for inviting me to present on this topic as part of the summer conversation. Um, and again, thank you, Michael, for the introduction and for helping to moderate this presentation and discussion today. So I'm going to talk to you today about a project that I conducted at Delaware County Community College um, to begin capturing OER usage and impact. I'm going to talk about what we did and why, some problems and issues, uh, a little bit of results that we found um, and future plans. And then I have some discussion questions if you all are interested in discussing at the end. But before I dive in, I wanna and talk about the project. I think it's important to have some context um, about our college and the history of OER and what OER support and advocacy looks like at my institution. Um, so, um, DCCC, what we refer to as Del uh, Delaware County Community College, we refer, refer to as DCCC. It serves Delaware and Chester counties, and we have six locations located throughout two counties with our main campus uh, being located in Media, PA. We're just due west of Philadelphia in the Philadelphia suburbs. We have courses offered in various disciplines. We have five academic divisions, including allied health and nursing, business, computing, and social sciences, STEM, communication, art and humanities, and a very robust workforce and economic development division. We offer associate's degrees, uh, certificate programs and continuing ed and courses um, are offered in various modalities as most places do these days, including in-person, hybrid and online. Um, you'll notice here on this slide, we have um, about 145 full-time faculty and 400 adjuncts at this point. As far as our student body, um, the majority of our students attend the college part-time, 40% receive financial aid, and we have about 100 international students. I believe our FTE at this point is around six, uh, six or 7,000. Um, and just as a side note, community colleges in Pennsylvania do not have a centralized system or administration as um, is the case in some states. Um, essentially in Pennsylvania, they're independent. Um, and you may or may not know there are many universities and colleges in Pennsylvania, particularly in the Philly region, and so we all compete for students. That said, we do have transfer agreements with many universities in the region. As far as OER, um, DCCC has been involved with OER since 2012. From 2012 to 2017, we had an alt text committee made up of membership from across the college. Um, and their charge was to explore this new OER, which it was in 2012, and then to start promoting it at the college. Um, and they had a couple uh, large grants during that time. Unfortunately, due to some administrative turnover in about 2017, the committee was disbanded. Um, however, efforts with OER continued. Um, in 2019, um, OER efforts were again a focus of the college. I was hired in the fall of 2019. My primary job is reference and instruction librarian, and I have a very fun small functional role as OER librarian, essentially. Since that time, uh, efforts have been made to advocate, promote, assist faculty interested in replacing their commercial textbooks. Um, I offer professional development opportunities regularly throughout the academic year. Um, I've offered um, 
Uh, I've had faculty user panels, lightning talks, sessions on Creative Commons, uh, finding OER, a variety. Um, I try and offer those throughout the year. They are not well attended, <laughs> but even if one person attends, I see it as a positive. And from a promotion and marketing standpoint, it just keeps OER uh, top of mind or in the minds of faculty administrators. So um, that's sort of where we are. Also, we don't currently have an OER committee and there is limited or mixed administrative interest and support for OER right now. We don't have a college-wide initiative and we don't offer money or release time for faculty to adopt, adapt, or create OER. We're a bare bones operation. <laughs> so that's where we are now, but I want to um, backtrack a bit to 2021. So I had been at the college for a couple of years. Um, and at that time, of course, um, a little bit uh, into the COVID pandemic, um, but um, I started thinking about how we could capture what was happening with OER at the college. I had seen kind of a steady increase in uh, faculty using OER and courses using OER, but we didn't have any way to really systematically know what was happening. Um, and we thought it would be a good idea to create an OER tracker or OER course inventory. Um, and so we wanted to create that. And then once we had that information, we were hoping to um, gather student impact information and present that information as well. So this was essentially uh, my plan, create an inventory of um, faculty and courses using OER then create this dashboard showing student impact, and then hopefully generate more interest in OER. So um, as I was developing this, I wanted to make sure it was manageable, sustainable, and really um, was cognizant and um, thoughtful about the culture uh, at DCCC and um, being aware of some pushback at the college as far as OER. Um, so I wanted to tread lightly, um, but um, create something that would be useful as well. Um, so one of the things I did, um, oh, actually, before I talk about that, I do want to mention some of the uh, resources that I consulted in developing uh, or coming up with this plan for an inventory and dashboard. So um, Open Oregon, their resources uh, list that has um, institutions and courses and what kind of OER they're using. That was an inspiration to me. Temple University had done something similar to what I was thinking in terms of an inventory. So they had sent out a faculty survey and they had started creating this internal survey of courses and faculty using OER. Um, also, at the time, CU Boulder and Penn State Berks had OER trackers. They're no longer publicly available, but they had those, and they were also a source of inspiration. As far as the dashboard idea, um, a lot of folks have done this. I'm really inspired by what the Lewis Consortium has done in Louisiana. Um, they have it dashboard information for all the institutions in Louisiana, um, but it's really nice. It shows a uh, number of students impacted and cost savings. So um, fairly straightforward and um, basic, but nice information. So those were all um, my sources of inspiration. So with this plan in mind, um, I wanted to uh, tap into the resources at the college and the expertise of the college. Um, I fumbled around a little bit thinking about how I wanted to put this all together and thought about uh, you know, doing something like an Excel spreadsheet um, maybe air tables, learning air tables. I, I don't know air tables, but I'm like, well, maybe I could learn it. <laughs> Microsoft BI was another option, but I reached out to our office of institutional effectiveness and asked if they would be interested in, um, in working on this with me. And Krishna Dunstan, who is our director of outcomes assessment was very interested, um, and thought it was a great idea. So fortunately, um, she had the tech know-how and the ability to, um, um, bring in student data and that sort of thing. Um, and so we worked together on this um, from the beginning. So the first thing we wanted to do was to um, start building an inventory, but we needed to know kind of who was doing what. We knew that Intro to Psychology was using OpenStax textbook and the Spanish faculty 
were um, using either open access or OER, we weren't quite sure. So um, we sent out a survey and this was modeled at, um, modeled from what Temple University had done. Um, I actually went through IRB um, because I didn't know if I'd be presenting this information. Um, but this was also another way for me to kind of introduce this project. And you can see in the red here, um, I talk about what this is. It would allow us to identify trends um, and some of the other information here. A source of inspiration to colleagues, that sort of thing. Here's the questions that I asked um, on the survey. Uh, it was essentially, do you currently teach a course using OER? Um, no or low cost learning materials. What strategies have you used? What are you using? Um, list the courses. If you're in the planning stages, please let us know. Um, if you don't plan to, please let us know that as well. Um, you know, with any survey development, <laughs> the devil's in the details. This took a long time to put together. Um, one of the challenges throughout this project is um, making sure the language that we use is clear. Um, so um, that's always a challenge. Um, faculty will think something is OER and it's actually more open access or it's library license. So um, this is this is a constant challenge and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. But, um, and you'll notice that we decided that low cost would be under $40. Um, so there we go. Um, here were the results. We sent out to 467 faculty. We got 56 responses. You'll see my asterisk there. Um, as you can imagine, we had a little bit of overlap. So there was um, a few uh, psychology faculty who told us about the intro to psych class, which we knew about. Um, so a little bit of overlap, but um, we did find out some things that we didn't know already. For example, it was all the language classes, both um, Spanish and faculty that were using um, open access materials. Um, there was the astronomy class that I didn't know was using the OpenStax textbook. There was a handful of English faculty using um, open access materials or their own developed materials. So we got a good amount of information from that initial survey. And then we were able to start building an inventory with that information. Um, Krishna Dunson um, from Institutional Effectiveness, she has created it on a, using O365 SharePoint with linked Excel pivot table. I'll show you this in a moment. Um, so, and if you want more information about that, uh, please reach out to me and I'll put you in touch with Krishna. But once we had built the initial inventory, then we sort of shared that information with contributing um, faculty from the survey and said, hey, does this information look great? What do you think of this inventory? Does it make sense? Is it clear? Uh, what, what comments do you have? I also wanted to make sure that faculty were okay with us including their information. I did have a couple of people say they didn't want their information shared. So um, I respected that and took that out. Um, we made some adjustments. And then um, we had additional calls for submissions, um, either once or twice before we really um, rolled it out completely. Uh, I sent emails to faculty. I didn't get much response. One of the other things I did though, was go down to the bookstore. Again, the bookstore wasn't um, super helpful with, with any of this and providing information, but I went down there to see if there was any open stacks textbooks or other things that look like OER textbooks on the shelves. And I was able to identify a US history um, course that was using uh, an open stacks textbook. So that was helpful. And I was able to add that information as well. This is what um, the inventory looks like. Um, it's on this DCCC course inventory platform that institutional effectiveness has created. And you can see over here, those course evaluations, they're intending to put course syllabi in here too. So it's a really uh, kind of robust site, um, a site that's not gonna disappear. It's not me just plopping something up there, um, but it's something that the institution has put together. And so there's information here about the inventory and here's the link to contribute and here's the link to the dashboard. I'm gonna talk about this contribute uh, feature to start. 
Um, and I'll just mention, I'll show you in a minute, right below this is the actual inventory. Uh, one other thing I want to mention too, we're calling it the OER inventory. Um, I'm not really happy with that name, but since it sounds like it's a list of OER being used, it's more like the course isn't faculty using OER. Um, so I'd like to change that name to either OER course inventory or OER tracker, which I think would be a lot more um, kind of accurate. Okay, so here's the submission form. There's some initial information here. And then um, the form asks for course number, course materials, type of materials being used, um, total cost of all the materials, whether the materials are used in all sections of the course. Um, this is important um, for those courses where it's just maybe a, a few faculty are using um, OER, open access materials, semester materials were first used, and then other information and comments. The form comes to me. It's a, a Microsoft form. It comes directly to me. I kind of vet it, uh, make sure everything seems okay, and then I add the information to the back end of the inventory. Here's what the inventory looks like. Um, you can see here there's division that's auto-populated. Here's the course. Here's the resource type. This will say OER, low cost, open access, library licensed, or faculty developed. The name, uh, name is an odd column name, but institutional effectiveness said we couldn't change it, <laughs> but it's the name of what's being used. And in some cases, um, it's okay. I can just put it in the OpenStax uh, title. In other cases, I have to put in a Word document that's a kind of a placeholder. We have the description here, the term it began, and the other sections include contributor and whether it's all sections or not. Now, when you're in the actual inventory, it's, it's a tad clunky. Um, you have to scroll down and you have to scroll over. But overall, I think it, it's pretty good. It just has some clunky features to it. And again, this is just for uh, faculty, administrator, and staff use at the college. It's not publicly available. Here again are the in inventory comp um, columns that I'm using. Um, we have 37 entries in there right now. Um, so in a, a variety, uh, again, uh, we kind of a mix of all courses um, or all uh, um, sections of a particular course or individual sections um, are using um, OER or open access materials or library license. All of art history is using um, open access. Astronomy is using an OpenStax textbook. Um, I'm happy to report organic chemistry is using an OpenStax textbook. Intro to marketing is using uh, an open access textbook um, and then some other um, uh, disciplines here as well. So it's nice to see a, a broad range of disciplines using um, OER, open access and library license materials. Now I want to talk about the dashboard again from that uh, that landing page. There's a link to the dashboard, um, and it will go to. I'll show you in just a moment. Um, it shows uh, students number of students impacted and cost savings. Hundred dollars is the cost savings per student for no cost materials, and this is sort of the industry the OER industry standard. And then we're using sixty dollars cost savings per student for low cost. Now, the thing about the dashboard is I have to manually add courses and sections each semester to the back end of this, um, but it's okay. It's not um, onerous uh, because we're relatively, uh, you know, we're a community college. It's it's not a ton of, of things um, to put in. It does take a little bit of time, however. <laughs> Here's what it looks like, and I'm sorry, it's a bit blurry. Um, we have spring 2023 and fall 2023 information here. Um, here's the savings by term and total students impacted and total sections participating. Um, I don't have spring 2024 data in here yet. Uh, we had a bit of a glitch with, with our enrollment numbers and our enrollment processing in the spring, um, but I'm hoping to get that updated um, at the beginning of fall semester. So fairly straightforward. 
Um, this big jump from spring to fall is not that there's suddenly an added number of OER courses. That's um, due to um, there's more sections of those classes using OER in the fall than there are in the spring. So once we had the inventory and dashboard ready to go, I'd done um, a little bit of testing with faculty who that hadn't contributed. Um, we gave a presentation to faculty in fall of 2023, and this was actually part of a librarian um, presentation to the faculty. And at this presentation, our administrators as well. Um, and so I talked about the project um, and demoed it. Um, but what was really nice is um, it started a conversation about how we could make this course information available to students. Now, one thing um, I didn't mention is that in Pennsylvania, we don't have mandated um, course marking. This is something we've been interested in, but we've had to tread a little bit lightly because um, there's some faculty who are very vocal about not wanting course marking because they don't want um, uh, those classes that have no or low cost items um, to take away um, from their classes, um, class enrollment. So anyway, um, this demonstration spurred this conversation. Advisors reached out to me afterwards asking if they could share the information with students. And there was um, interest from the vice president of academic affairs um, saying we need to um, present this information. So that, um, and as a side note, started this whole discussion about course marking and we now currently have a proposal um, for the college to start course marking which will actually help us in um, providing uh, uh, the inventory information and the dashboard information in the long run and then one of the things i do now moving forward is each semester i email the inventory and dashboard information to faculty and ask for um, up, either updated information if they're no longer using OER or if they need to change something um, or if they are now using OER open access. Some of the challenges, um, there's been a lot. <laughs> Working with institutional effectiveness was great. Uh, but also uh, challenging because I'm working with their time. And so um, we would try and meet every other week for a few minutes if we could, but that wasn't always the case. So there's, um, it, it can take time um, for us to get things um, done together. Um, developing the functionality of the inventory and the columns was a challenge given, given the platform that institutional effectiveness was using. But I think we worked it out, it just took a while. Um, recruiting faculty contribute is an ongoing challenge. And as I mentioned, some faculty are hesitant to contribute um, for a variety of reasons. And then maintaining everything, I have to make sure to do that um, every semester and make sure everything's up to date. Um, some other challenges, uh, that baseline for affordable content or low cost, we put it at $40, but some places in some states tie it to minimum wage, maybe that's better. Um, I, I think $40 is a bit high, I would say $10, <laughs> but, but that's a conversation I need to have. Um, uh, with uh, folks at the college to determine what they want to do with that. Um, we've been using $100 as the average price of the textbook cost savings. That's, again, industry standard. Determining the enrollment in courses. Um, we pull in the enrollment information. We wait um, until the semester is way um, quite underway. Usually, I actually wait until towards the end of the semester to make sure we're getting the right information. Also, we have... Um, uh, shorter semester classes. And so we need to make sure that we um, pull in the information at the correct time so we, we get the correct enrollment information. Um, and then more broadly, OER challenges, clarity, definitions, and information. Again, you know, what's low cost, what's not um, dispelling myths. There's still quite a lot of those um, that we have at our college um, with faculty um, and their understanding of OER. And then inclusive access course materials, um, the number of courses using inclusive access of our college is increasing. And so that's a bit of a challenge um, of how we, um, we deal with that. Our next steps, um, we wanna look further at student outcomes in OER courses. Once we have uh, several semesters of the inventory information, we can really um, look more uh, about the impact um, the courses are having on students. Um, 
we can look at withdrawal rates and pass rates and that sort of thing. Um, I'd like to deploy student surveys and courses using the no and low cost materials. And since we have these courses, we can start doing that. We have to do that um, this next semester. I'd like to develop and produce a yearly college OER impact report. Um, and of course, working more on administrative buy-in and support and, and faculty um, buy-in and support as well. Um, continue to monitor discussions about how best to collect and display impact information. I'm interested to hear what you all, your all thoughts are on that. Um, and then we're really continuing progress on our course marking proposal that we hope will give us even more um, data to take a look at. Um, here's some of the references that I referred to earlier, and um, actually I have these in a Google document that I'll put in the chat in a second. Um, these are the ones I mentioned um, that were kind of inspirational to me. And then I put some other resources that I think are really great right now. Um, and let me put that link in, in the chat for you all if you're interested in those resources. Um, Gabby Hernandez has done some great information. She's got this Airtable template that's really nice to keep track of what we are impact and use. Jeff Gallant has been fantastic, and he's in his OER starter kit, chapter 21. He has information about data collection and strategies. And here's a few other resources that you may be interested in as well. So that's what we've done at Delaware County Community College. Um, again, it was really grew out of us not knowing who was doing what, and we needed to know, and we felt like we needed to know who was doing that, what to move forward with OER. Um, the project has turned out to do what I wanted it to do, to kind of be another way of advertising that uh, OER is an option and look what folks are doing here at the college and how we can build on that. Um, and also, as I mentioned, it spurred that, that conversation, that interest in course marking. So I hope that was interesting. Um, if you have questions, please put them in the chat. I do have some discussion questions if anybody's interested in discussing further. I'd like to know what you're doing at your institution. If you have course marking, if that has made, um, has that's helped with providing um, outcome and impact information. Um, thank you for the question about um, sharing out publicly. No, not at this time. Um, what we're hoping happens, <laughs> so it's internal right now. Um, and we don't want to make it public at this time. Um, what we'd like to do is have course marking be implemented, and then that information will be um, available in the course res res uh, reservation system. So the dashboard is um, done through institutional effectiveness and it was, um, it's um, Microsoft Office 365 with Excel pivot tables. And if you want more information about the back end of it, I can put you in touch with uh, Christian Dunson who um, has done the back end technology part of it and pulled in information. The 100 is the industry standard. Um, that's what I found everywhere. Um, believe Open Oregon even mentions that in the blog post that I that I put in the references. Um, they talk, they have a blog post about um, calculating student costs and um, they use the $100, which I think is a bit high, but you know, it's sort of this industry standard. I call it the industry standard, but that a lot of places use that. So Louise, I'm gonna jump in. Uh, one of the benefits of having the microphone, right? Uh, so you talked about um, not sharing this out publicly, this data right now, and j just knowing some of the backstory, that's because a lot of faculty did not want to promote that they're using OER to their colleagues. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that and maybe how that may be impacting course marking at Delaware County Community College. Yeah, so that's a big issue that we are having. Um, there is a hesit hesitancy um, because in certain disciplines, um, the faculty don't feel as though there um, is OER available. Um, they're not necessarily interested in creating um, OER. And so they're having trouble finding materials. They feel as though 
if this information is made publicly available or may put in course marking that students will gravitate towards courses that do have no and low cost course materials and take um, students away from them for these other courses. So that's a challenge that we're having right now. I haven't seen a lot of discussion uh, in the OER community about that issue. Um, it's, it's, I would say it's been a significant issue at our college. And I would say, for example, if there's elective classes, the students will tend to take the one that has uh, the courses that have no and low cost materials. Oops, I'm sorry. So Amanda had a question um, and she was just wondering about how you can encourage faculty to fill out the survey uh, at Amanda's institution, they're struggling get, getting faculty to report on their OER adoption uh, and only had three people fill it out. So how can you get more people to engage in this, this um, you know, information sharing? Yeah, so I think one thing is uh, what I found is if one person does it, then somebody's like, oh, well, I can provide my information too. So there's a bit of, you know, this sort of... Um, snowball effect a little bit. Um, but I do have, we do have faculty who um, initially were like, yeah, I can put my information in. And they were like, no, I don't want it in there. Um, and it's for a variety of reasons. Um, maybe they have an official textbook for their course and they're actually using something else. Um, so that gets a little sticky. They may not want to share what they're using. Um, so I think it would be important to find out, it's difficult to know, and I think everybody may have their own reasons, but I think we need to ask faculty why they're hesitant. I, I tend not to ask and just respect it, but um, I think that's um, worthwhile to ask. So Kevin, okay. what a great thing happening at Mount Hood. I was wondering if you, if you have a microphone, if you want to open it up and talk a little bit about the um, course section reporting that faculty are doing through their form, uh, how you got that through and how it works? Well, I can't really take any credit for the establishment of the course section reporting form or CSRF as we call it. Uh, my predecessor got that in motion. She actually uh, wrote a white paper about it that is um, that is out there. I should be able to I should be able to track that down actually. Um, I can even put a link to it uh, in the in the thing. But yeah, we uh, we actually have a lot of information that uh, that is coming at us. For me, it's a matter of I need to find a way to like consolidate it and present it so that we can show both faculty and administration and students, especially uh, how you know uh, OER and, and the no cost, low cost uh, program are saving people money and. Uh, what kind of impact they are having on uh, on student success and so on. Um, I've presented some of the raw data to uh, our Dean of Instruction recently. She was recently hired um, and uh, she's a big OER advocate. And when she saw the data, she was like, this is great. So I was like, awesome. But I just need to find a way to really put it out there. Um, but yeah, I can dig up that uh, white paper right now, actually. Yeah, I appreciate that. I, I, just one more question for you, because you, you mentioned working with your bookstore manager. I was wondering how that relationship has developed, because that's often a stumbling block. Yeah, our we uh, my again, my predecessor uh, uh, deserves a lot of credit. Her name is uh, Heather White, and she got the uh, the the program rolling here in 2015. Um, I was part time at the time and worked with her on the committee, but she did so much work. Um, and one of the things she did is she formed um, a committee, a textbook affordability committee, and um, she got the bookstore involved. And uh, Michelle Perry is our our kind of liaison now. We have we since moved to um, using Academos, one of the vendors, uh, and they closed down the physical bookstore. Alas, when the uh, pandemic uh, hit. Um, but Michelle is great. Uh, she's very supportive of textbook affordability. Uh, we actually work together uh, because she needs to get 
faculty to report their adoptions, <clears throat> excuse me, and I need faculty to turn in this CSRF and all this is voluntary. Um, and so we coordinate our efforts to essentially nag them into compliance, uh, you know, and, and, and the return rate is pretty good. We, um, it, it kind of fell off for a period during the real depths of the pandemic, but it managed to uh, uptake one. And that nagging thing, just that constant, like very gentle cajoling on a consistent basis, um, not like every week, but, you know, every every few weeks just to be like reminder you know and try to ex put it in the context of how this is how this fits within the framework of uh, Oregon law uh, because we do have a lot of um, uh, backing from the state legislature on this so which is helpful um, and so uh, uh, yeah we we work pretty well together on these efforts and we both uh, um, provide data to each other um, and so uh, I'm, a, I'm able to get access to the uh, academic side of um, the data and get to get what they're pulling and kind of compare what I have with what they have. So it's a pretty productive relationship. I think bringing in the, the, um, the textbook buyers early on uh, at the bookstore um, and talking with them about uh, what uh, our efforts and align with their efforts to save students money. Um, it helps, I think, in a way it does help that uh, uh, Michelle is, she works for the college and the vendor works for itself, obviously, but she is like the liaison and she, she's able to best represent our interests with them. Um, but yeah, a, a lot of it, it and I've, I've noticed with a lot of other bookstore managers across the state that they are also very concerned about saving, saving students money and are aware of some of the more nefarious publishing industry practices. <laughs> that's that's really great. I really like that. And thank you for sharing that. Yeah, no problem. David, if you you put in the chat that you're in your second semester of course marking and that you're finding that half of your faculty are using low or no cost materials, I was just wondering if you'd be willing to speak a little bit about how you got course marking through your institution uh, and were you surprised by the numbers? Um, not necessarily. Um, we had started promoting OER or open uh, low cost, no cost materials if possible. Uh, since around 2017, we'd had a few prior grants that allowed anywhere from four to six faculty members a semester uh, to plan to flip courses to low or no cost. Um, and we're about out of the most recent grant for that. Um, last summer, we were at the start of a grant from NEBI, uh, New England Board of Higher Education, uh, to create the course marking system. <coughs> Um, and we were actually a little ahead of the rest in our cohort uh, because we had actually a homegrown system. Um, so we didn't have as many of the technical issues to jump through that some others had with the, you know, the for-profit systems they were using. So we had, uh, my boss is actually, by background, a programmer, and we have a programmer. Um, so between the two of them, the system was pretty much up and running really quick. Um, and then it was just a matter of getting people used to the idea of doing it. Uh, many of them were already working with those types of materials. So it was just a matter of, you know, filling out the form. Oh, that's excellent. That's excellent. Thank you for sharing. I really appreciate that. And it, it's I'm glad to see in the chat that there, we're, we're making those connections between uh, the, the inventory and the list that are being developed and sharing it with advisors and uh, I don't know if anybody wants to speak to that. I know, Louise, you said you shared that with advisors at Delaware County Community College. Yeah, they asked to see it. And also um, our student resources um, coordinator um, asked to see it as well. So our student resources department, um, they'll provide or help uh, students who are unable to afford a textbook. They will get textbooks for them. So, But I've provided uh, the inventory to link to him as well so he can share that. Excellent. And so uh, Holly asked a great question about um, 
using this strategically and connecting with advisors to help with students with uh, financial issues. So that, that really addresses that. And we could see a good discussion about using Power BI as a useful tool to, to gather and um, distribute this information. And it's, I'm glad to see course marking. So as we think about this from a, a research perspective, Louise or anybody else, how, how do you see developing this inventory help with research at your institution to really see what the impact is? And for those that have implemented this, were you surprised? So Louise, I don't know, were you, were you surprised by the numbers? I was surprised by the numbers because I had no idea. I mean, honestly, limited idea about who was doing what. So, and I think there's more folks doing things. I just don't know about that. And uh, as somebody mentioned, how do you get somebody, how do you get faculty to contribute to this? It's, it can be difficult or it's just off their radar. Um, so again, I, I tr try to every semester send an email to faculty saying, hey, we have this inventory. If you'd like to contribute, that would be great. Um, but I, I think course marking, I, the dream of course marking, I think would really help with us um, getting consistent information every semester and um, true information every semester. One of the challenges we have with this inventory right now is that I have to update the information each semester, whereas if we had that in, from course marking, we could bring it in um, and it would um, be a lot easier. So I think you asked a really great question here uh, on your list of what metrics and measures do you think are important now? And I was wondering if you want to talk about this or anybody else, if anybody wants to jump in, talk about metrics and measures that they think are important, especially as we think about impact, right? Because it's not just course savings, right? It could There are many things that we could be measuring. So yeah. Louise, is there anything else that you'd like to kind of pull out of added some yeah. of this data? Well, one thing is, since we know or have a, a smattering of courses that are using OER or other no and low cost materials, um, is that student survey. And I'd really like to capture that information because that's one thing that we haven't done at the college is get the opinions of the of the students um, and see what they think. Uh, so I'd like to definitely do that. Um, um, and that's what we want to do this fall. Um, and then also with that information is, um, is seeing over time if there's changes in, um, you know, withdrawal rates or um, or um, passing the classes and that sort of thing. So, um, but again, that's once we have a few semesters of information in the inventory. And, and clearly course marking probably would help facilitate this, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Oh, Austin, I like that, the course modality. That's that's a really um, good thing to look at versus in-person versus e-learning and versus hybrid model. I like that. Yeah, I think that's, that's really interesting as well. Um, I think that would be great to capture. And Lauren, what, what a great, great thing there too, in terms of metrics, thinking about course materials that are coming from courseware versus a digital textbook and everywhere in between. And especially as we think about library license material, we think about um, inclusive access models now, that, that's a really great point. And so, you know, I, I will say this, how do you speak to faculty who may not be versed in OER about inclusive access and what that really means? And is that truly open? <laughs> So Louise, I know at, at Delaware County Community College, you've had that issue where there's a movement towards inclusive access. Um, how do you speak with fa to faculty about that? So that's uh, really important because as I mentioned, there's more and more courses uh, using inclusive access and the, the publishers have been um, pretty aggressive <laughs> reaching out to faculty um, with their inclusive access uh, materials. Uh, that's a challenge. Um, I I haven't really honestly developed a way to talk to faculty about that. I think one thing that would be useful to bring up with faculty is the open pedagogy um, and even just regular pedagogy. Like, you know, I don't know. These packages are just, <laughs> here you go. Here's everything you need. Um, and so I think if we get into that conversation about open pedagogy, I 
I think that a lot of faculty would be interested in that. I also think that faculty don't understand, and administrators as well, don't completely understand what these inclusive access models are. Um, that inclusiveaccess.org um, has great information about that. And I think that's an, another thing that we need to really start um, having discussions with faculty about is that these models are um, uh, not great um, for students. Um, I think a lot of faculty just think of it, oh, well, they have first day access, so it's fine. Um, so I think we need to start having more conversations about that, especially since we're seeing an increase in the number of courses uh, using those um, those inclusive access um, materials. And, and Lauren brings up a great point. Again, um, faculty don't yeah. feel like they have an alternative yeah. because they include uh, quizzes, interactive uh, simulations, things like that, especially in the sciences. And so, uh, you know, with everybody here, how do we speak to faculty about ancillary course material um, and how that fits in this discussion, especially as, you know, inclusive access models provide all of that? <laughs> Oh, and I would say, oh, I'm sorry. I was just going to say what is nice to see now is, uh, especially with OpenStax, and I think that Open Textbook Library, but there, there's a lot of ancillary materials now available to go with those o OER um, materials. Not a ton, but there, there are a few. And so, as you're thinking about your, your, um, you know, your survey of faculty. Does it include a component for ancillary course materials to see if they're creating it or using it? And do you think there's a value to having that as another option within the survey? Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, I think that's um, a direction we need to go in um, and discuss with faculty and see if um, where that lies. You know, how would we put that in an inventory or or that sort of thing? I'm just scrolling through the chat, see if we missed any questions. Um, and so with, with your institutional survey, um, the institutional response was positive. So now you have your vice president of academic affairs that's interested in OER, uh, low and no cost materials. Um, do you think that this will bring a cultural shift at your institution? Yeah, I, I think it already has, um, definitely. Um, and, and last year, you know, after that fall kind of roll out of the inventory and dashboard and then that resulting conversation about course marking, um, and then we put together a proposal uh, for course for the college to adopt course marking. So I think um, the conversation is um, um, getting larger, I would say. I, I think it's more acceptable than it was just a few years ago. Um, there was a lot of hesitancy in 2019 when I started with OER. And I think um, a lot of folks are just coming around and saying, I mean, this might be a good thing. So, especially when you bring it up in terms of competing with other colleges and universities in the area, um, you know, that can uh, be a motivator. Um, and I saw that with the, the Vice President of Academic Affairs. And I'm just seeing the discussion on inclusive access in, in the chat right now. And I like the idea of changing the terminology to automatic billing. I, I really like that. And I'll throw this out not only to Louise, but to everybody. Is there a benefit to start documenting that who is uh, adopting an inclusive access model at their institution, similar to how we talk about course marking, to better engage in these conversations? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I would say yes. I was given a list um, of courses that currently had inclusive access, um, which was helpful, but I didn't really quite know what to do with it. Um, but I think knowing what courses are are using that or even thinking about it um, can be useful. Um, and we can have that conversation about um, OER instead, perhaps.
just looking through. Beren has a, a question in the chat. Um, to what extent have community college systems across the United States collaborated on OER development and sharing? I think that's a great question. Uh, given uh, the demonstrated success of OER initiatives in states like California, uh, could a nationwide standardized approach to OER creation, implementation, and evaluation enhance affordability and student success while avoiding redundant efforts? Yes. <laughs> I totally think this is helpful. Yes, California, Oregon, I think it would be great. Yeah, if we could all just come together and create this, what you're suggesting is, is yeah. And let me ask you, knowing that Pennsylvania is a decentralized system, right? And I can't, I shouldn't even say system, it's just independent institutions at the community college level. Uh, is there, a, you know, a benefit to being having that centralized structure? And how can a state that's decentralized, uh, you know, work towards these efforts? What do you think? Yeah, I think if there's a centralized uh, nationwide sort of effort or system, um, like suggested, that that could be really beneficial and that could get Pennsylvania kind of, even though we're decentralized, to to um, take a look at that. We do have Affordable Learning PA, which is an organization in Pennsylvania that really um, supports and advocate, advocates for OER in the state, um, which has been great. They've had um, sort of mixed funding over the years, so, um, um, but they're starting to build up again. And I think um, they could get involved with something this, like this and really be a leader and bring in institutions as well because we're all kind of doing the same thing. And I think that goes to that redundancy question, <laughs> You're right? Yes, yes. Uh, thank you everybody who's sharing some resources in yeah. the chat. Um, I think that's great. And so we could see uh, the OER Arizona uh, to support the work at the grant as well as a grant in New Jersey. And so as we're wrapping up our time today, any other questions? Let's see any other questions, but some good comments going in the chat, some great resources. Um, Lucinda, Mike, thank you for sharing the OER Arizona annual free yeah. event. Um, our grant is through the Department of Education, and so people might want to look to see if there are is grant money available, because the fact that I could offer stipends to my, I'm the Dean of Arts and Sciences, I could offer stipends to my faculty to develop materials. So they worked as departments. I have three departments that are already 100% textbook free. And I have two more that probably will be by um, the end of this term. They created lab manuals. They created um, alternate textbooks. They they we basically went through training to learn how to use the Creative Commons um, and the copyright. Our librarians went through training, so I really encourage everyone to get their librarians trained so that they can help support the research and the development, Louise is nodding her head. So she probably has librarians have been part of that as well. Instructional designers, you know, they, we've got right now, you know, Arizona is a huge state. My county's the size of Connecticut, you know? So when you think about how much open space we have and how far apart we are, we've managed to put eight schools together and to have really strong working connections with the librarians, the um, instructional designers, the faculty groups to plan, and to get this stuff motivated. And a lot of it is it is the focus of our retention efforts, you know, the, for student success and retention. You know, it really is a big piece of that. So. Yeah, um, yeah Lucinda, and, and thank you for sharing that. It is a free conference. And so, you know, it, uh, if you save that link, it's usually in March and, um, I've presented on a couple of panels on there trying to get some of the bigger schools to realize that 70% of their students do not buy textbooks and try to pass the course. You know, when you look at that statistic alone should be enough to motivate you. 
couldn't agree more. I cite it at my institution all the time. <laughs> And I would agree that the Creative Commons certification is is excellent. Yeah, these are great resources. Everything here is fantastic. And, and Creative Commons does have multiple trainings that librarians can go through to get certified. That you know, it's worth it's worth doing. I mean, we've got people at Ohio, or not Ohio, that's my old school, um, Arizona State, <laughs> who who um, have gone through the training and are really pushing um, to get a lot of people there on board. It's harder, obviously, in the big schools. Yeah, yeah. Well, I just want to bring everybody's attention because some people are are jumping off our our our, our uh, summer conversation right now. Uh, just make sure that you, as you're leaving, if you want to go and click on the link that Liz put in the chat for a short survey to let us know your thoughts on our summer conversation. It helps us plan future summer conversations. And as we're wrapping up our time, Louise, is there anything else that you'd like to share about um, conducting in? Uh, uh, an assessment or an uh, institutional wide inventory? Yeah, if, um, and you know, I didn't really talk about the technology that we're using. Um, again, it's institutional, our Office of Institutional Effectiveness that is uh, that does the back end of everything. But if you're interested in that, please reach out to me. Um, let me put my email in the, the uh, chat here and um, just send me an email and I'll put you in touch with Krishna and we can get that information for you. And I, and I can't thank you enough for bringing up those connections on campus with institutional effectiveness, that office or uh, institutional research, whatever it may be called at your institution. Because as we think about how we're going to research the impact of OER, you know, building those connections and those collaborative relationships are so important. So it looks like we're heading towards the... Uh, <laughs> Uh, the end of our time today. Louise, I, I want to thank you so much for talking about um, uh, the work that you're doing at Delaware County Community College. And I want to thank everybody for their excellent resources that they're sharing in the chat, questions, comments, and stories about their institution. I think this is really important as we all think about how we're going to research the impact of OER at our institution. And I agree, one of the goal, the long-term goals for, for this committee through CCC OER is to start building that capacity for multi-institutional research so that we can really see what the impact is and, and the impact we're having on our students. So once again, I wanna thank everybody for our, joining us for our summer conversation. Louise, I wanna thank you again. Thank it's you. been an absolute pleasure. Thank you everybody.